When it comes to talking about salaries, often the answer is it depends. And I know even I don't enjoy that answer. So today we're going to talk about that depends. Hey everyone, my name is Kajal and welcome to my channel where we deep dive into the world of robotics engineering. Today, we're tackling a topic that's crucial for any field, salaries. Whether you're starting out or negotiating a salary, it's important to understand how to calculate your salary range. So today, we're going to break that down. I'm going to talk about what that salary includes, what are the different sources you can use to calculate the salary range, and I will also go through some examples. So without further to do let's get into it start by talking about the different components that goes into the salary of a robotics engineer. The first one is the cash component of the salary. This is money you will actually get. Of course, it's subjected to taxes and any withholdings, but this is money that you will actually see coming into your bank and in your paycheck. The second component is benefits. So this, for example, could be 401k, which is retirement. I do want to say, even if you're an international student, you can utilize this feature. Now, the most popular one is usually a match. What this means is, let's say it's a 4% match and you're making 100,000 in salary. When you put in 4% of your 100,000 salary, that is $4,000, the company will match and put additional $4,000 into that account. So the total would now be $8,000, wherein you contributed four and your company contributed another four. Once again, this may also have tax implications, so make sure you check for that as well. Now, retirement account, as the name suggests is for your retirement so generally you can only withdraw this in retirement but there are certain circumstances in which you can withdraw early there are also situations where you can withdraw by paying a 10% penalty now the reason I'm mentioning this is because I see a lot of international students not take benefit of this and leave money on the table so going with the same example let's say your company has a 4% match now even if you take the penalty and withdraw it early which is about 10% you are only giving up $800 out of $8,000. That is about $7,200. And so you contributed $4,000 and you still have access to additional $3,200 from the company match. Once again, I'm not talking about tax implications and the growth that you may get out of retirement, any fees and so on and so forth. But this is basically an example of making sure you calculate and check if it is worth it for you to invest and if it works for your situation. Next component is bonus. This is usually a percentage. Now, in most cases, when it comes to robotics engineering positions, it's usually performance based. They will give you a number, for example, let's say 10%, then that 10% is what you could get if you perform to the expectations. If you don't, you might get less. If you perform better, you may even get more than that, but it's just a rough approximate number. But it is a number to keep in mind and also make sure this is a subjective component. Next up, we have stocks and options. Now, it's important to understand the difference between the two. Stocks is something you can trade in and cash it out for value. Option on the other hand, as the name suggests, is an option to purchase a stock in the future at a preferred rate. So this means only if the company goes successful and starts trading publicly, will you be able to take advantage of this. Once again, there are going to be tax implications, but this is a simplified version of it so that you can get a basic understanding of what these options mean. Similar to bonus, stocks and options both are a percentage of your base salary. Let's say they're giving you 20% as stocks. That means you're getting stocks worth $20,000. But and this is a very important part. Usually when it comes to stocks and options, there's a cliff period and there's a vesting schedule. Now, what does that mean? It means you will start getting these stocks in a periodic manner. So the first component is cliff. It means only after a certain amount of time has passed, will you be able to get any of that portion vested. So for example, let's say you got 4,000 for four years and the cliff is one year. For the first 12 months, you're not going to get anything out of the those stock options. So if you leave the company, you're completely losing all of these components. If you stay, then at the end of the first, you get a certain percentage of that stock or option. Let's say it's 25% for one year cliff. 
So at the end of year one, 25% of the original stock options, which was 4,000, then it's 1,000, is what you get vested. That means that $1,000 worth of stocks are options are yours. Now, depending on the company, they may have different vesting schedules. Some will have quarterly after that, some will have monthly. So based on that vesting schedule, you start getting those options or stocks. So make sure you understand how all of this works when you're getting an offer. Now, when it comes to robotics engineering, most of the companies are startups and you're most likely going to get options instead of stocks. If it's a publicly traded company, you're more likely to get stocks. I also want to talk about a special condition that happens when there are no public trading components. If there's no options or stocks, another thing that you will often see is long-term incentives. The idea is similar to stock and options, wherein they're trying to get you to stay for a long period of time and the loyalty is rewarded in form of either stocks, options or cash, which in this case would be long-term incentives. Now, the main purpose of this video is to talk about the salary. So I'm only giving a brief overview of this. And of course, there's a lot more to it. But I hope this gives you a generic idea of what to expect. Now, the other reason I'm talking about all of these is because most of these benefits are percentage based and the percentage is tied to your base salary. So when you're negotiating, the first thing you should try and negotiate is your base salary because it impacts all these other components, the 401k match, the stock options, the bonus. Another thing that's often tied to your base is the increment you get year after year. So when performance review comes into picture, after you get your bonus, you often also get an increment on your base salary. And the increment they are offering you is 5%. It's going to be 5% of the 100K and your new salary will be $105,000. But if your base salary was $110,000, it would be 5% of $110,000. So when it comes to negotiation, make sure you're first negotiating your base salary because it's the strongest component. After that, you should start negotiating the percentages. Now, often things like 401k, which is company-wide and standard, is something you can't negotiate. But there are things you can negotiate, which is percentage of bonus, percentage of stocks, options or long term incentives. And you can also negotiate PTO. PTO is paid time off. Now, generally what I've seen in robotics is most of them are startups and opt to go for unlimited vacation time. I feel this is like a very strange thing because when it's unlimited, you don't really realize how much you can and cannot ask. So when you're discussing or negotiating, if they say unlimited, make sure to ask what is the expectation. You can ask that I understand it's unlimited, but can you give me an idea of what is the standard or how much or how many weeks do you generally expect people to take? In robotics engineering space, I have seen three to four weeks as standard for someone who's starting out. If you're at a senior position, you may be able to get away with five weeks. Now, the other reason I mentioned PTO is let's say it's not unlimited and there's a set period. Once again, you can negotiate it. Let's say they offered you three weeks and they're not able to negotiate any other components. You can ask for four weeks instead of three. Now, again, depending on which state you are in, if you leave the company and you've not used your PTO, if they were not unlimited, you can actually cash out the unused PTO. I know there was this one company that I worked for. I was laid off, but I had a couple of uh, paid time off days that I hadn't used yet. They actually gave me a check for those unused PTO. So make sure that's also a component you can negotiate and also a component you should ask for in your offer details, even if they're not negotiating it. This is another great tip. When you're negotiating and when you're talking about salaries, everything that they mention on the phone, make sure it's included in the offer letter before you sign. With this, let's jump into the next component as to how you get all of these information. I'm going to talk about different sources and what information you can get from these different sources. All right, the first one is actually the job listing itself. Depending on which state you are in, for example, California, you can actually see the salary range listed on the job description. Now, most of the time, this is going to be a range, but it can give you a good idea of what to expect. And this is also a great way to get information for similar listings. Let's say you're looking at company A. It's a small or a medium sized company. Look for similar companies in the area and look at their job listing. This way you will get information about what the salary range is and what 
to expect. A second source is Glassdoor. With Glassdoor, you get a range and depending on who reported it, it could be the cash component or the total compensation package. And when I say total compensation package, it includes stocks, options, long-term incentives or any sign-on bonuses they may have gotten. So the other thing to do with Glassdoor is make sure you read the reviews or you read the comments that people have put in. It's a great way to get insights into these different components, which is the bonuses, the percentage of stocks, options, vesting schedules, so on and so forth. Next, once again, you should compare similar companies to get a breadth of ideas. Third one is LinkedIn. What I mean by this is you can reach out to people and get some information with finesse. Now, salary is a very touchy subject and it's not often easy to get that kind of information from someone. Here's a tip. Go for someone who might be at a higher position, who might be willing to give you some information about their previous job or previous positions that you are currently applying for. This information might be slightly dated, but it still gives you an idea of what to expect. Now, the other thing is, even if someone's not willing to give you the total number or the salary number, you can still ask for advice or information on the bonus component, the percentage and the benefits component. This once again, sometimes can be a huge benefit when you're negotiating and trying to understand what to expect. But please do it with finesse, do it with kindness and do expect that someone may not be willing to share this information. So it is an option that you can try, but it is slightly difficult and tricky and I've also tried it personally and gotten mixed reviews. LinkedIn is kind of similar to networking so if you've done in-person networking and you've made some good connections you can tap on those connections to get advice. Again this is something I've personally done as well when I've switched jobs I reach out to people who I know who are probably at a higher position and I talk to them and be like hey here's an offer I have gotten I'm okay discussing the numbers that I have gotten if you can give me some advice on is this a good offer or it's a shit offer am, am I getting lowballed and it has come in handy a lot of times when people can tell me hey you know what this part looks solid but this is something that you should press on and try to get a better number because I know you can do better than that once again this is kind of tricky and it requires social skills it might not be something you can do straight away but I think in the long term if you try and network and build those connections this can be a really good tool to get some information information, help and advice when you're negotiating or having conversations about salary. My next source is something where you can get actual numbers. It's called the H1B salary database. Now this is reported by companies to the institute that handles all of this. So they are accurate numbers. It's a great way to get some straight up numbers on the base salary component and have actual information. The only thing is because it is for H1B, you only get information about people who hold H1B statuses. Now when I say information, you're not seeing anyone's personal information. You're not going to be able to google people's name that's not what's gonna happen here it's a database with title salary location and the name of the company again this is a great way to gather information but take it with a grain of salt because it doesn't include the amount of experience someone has for that position but i will say it's a great way to see real base numbers and again compare for similar companies when you're interviewing make sure you ask what's the head count what stage the company is in and this is something you can use to look for similar companies of similar size similar location so all of these are great sources to get some numbers some percentages and then come up with a range for yourself Okay, as promised, I'm also going to talk about some examples. Let's say you are on East Coast starting out versus you're on West Coast starting out. I would say on East Coast, the salary range are slightly lower. So at the least, even if you don't have any experience and you're just starting out as a robotics engineer, you can at least expect a salary range of sixty to $80,000. Whereas on the West Coast, you can expect slightly higher salary because the standard of living is higher and the taxes are also higher. So on the West Coast, you can expect anywhere between 80 to 100 thousand dollars. Now again this is a global scale so let me take another example. Let's compare Austin Texas versus Boston Massachusetts. When it comes to Austin let's say you're working at a mid-sized company the salary range can be anywhere between 80 to 120 thousand dollars. Now compare this with Boston Massachusetts for a similar mid-sized company as 
someone who's starting out, you can expect slightly more competitive salary range in the range of $90,000 to $140,000. You can also see the range has become slightly different because once again, these are two different areas. Compared to Austin, Boston is more competitive. It's also slightly more expensive to live in. So you can expect that slightly higher range of salary. But also make sure you understand that Oh, I'm getting $10,000 more at the minimum means it's better to go for Boston. Think again. Texas has no state tax. Boston, Massachusetts does have a 5% state tax. Also, it's way more expensive to rent a place in Boston compared to Austin. So when you're looking at salary range, my next advice is also make sure you look at what it is like to live in that city. And this is something you can actually Google. Standard of living, average cost of rent, average grocery for a family of two or for a single individual in Austin or in Boston. And this is a great way to kind of calculate what to expect. My top advice for you is negotiate. Make sure you're at least trying and asking for a better salary or bonuses. And you don't need a second job offer to negotiate. I have negotiated plenty of times without having a second job offer and gotten better money. Recruiters do expect that you will negotiate. So if you don't, you're leaving money on the table. I do understand this is not a fun experience. So here's another recommendation. There's a book called Never Split the Difference. It's a great book for picking up some negotiation skills. I highly recommend it. I will also leave a link in the description. I'll also include links of all the sources I have mentioned. I do hope this was a great way for you to get some information about salary expectations for robotics engineering. If you found this video helpful, make sure to give it a like and if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.